Hi everybody, I'm Michael Edson and I'm the Director of Web and New Media Strategy here at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Uh, when Kyle and Michael asked me to participate in your awesome hyperlibrary MOOC, I jumped at the chance uh, because I've been thinking about a lot of the same issues they have uh, for a long time. Uh, and I'm delighted to be part of the mix, uh, and I'll be watching the MOOC and watching your progress very closely from here in Washington. Um, a lot of my work uh, recently centers around three ideas, scope, scale, and speed. Scope is what we can choose to work on. Scale is how big that work can be, and speed is the pace at which we move. And I think that the world has changed fundamentally and foundationally in these three dimensions, scope, scale, and speed. But most people haven't noticed. Most organizations haven't noticed. Uh, and even fewer have taken concrete action. Um, and it's as if we're satisfied with the methods and outcomes of the 20th century, uh, where being successful meant having physical patrons, having physical collections, hiring the best experts, uh, and being essentially a broadcaster of knowledge and expertise. I think the equation has changed dramatically, and I think it's time to uh, recognize that we can have bigger dreams. The Smithsonian Institution, uh, among many other activities, flies telescopes in outer space for NASA. One out of every six Smithsonian employees works in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the Smithsonian Harvard Astrophysical Observatory. And this is a picture of one of our instruments, the Chandra X-ray Telescope. I was talking with a project astrophysicist last year, and he told me that they won't even consider a new project unless it returns a 10 times improvement over the last one. And that with every 10 times improvement, the project team can see 10 times farther back to the beginning of the universe, 10 times farther back in time. And that 10 times improvement isn't just a, a statistic, isn't just something on an analytics report. This is a simulation of a 10 times improvement from the last instrument within that small postage stamp sized picture to the current instrument. It's a dramatic and breathtaking improvement. And to drive home, to, to maybe to paint out this, this idea about scale and speed, uh, let's make some graphs. A familiar XY coordinate system between every horizontal line is a difference of 10 million people. And across the x-axis in the bottom, every uh, x-axis tick mark represents one year for the 33 years between 1978 and 2011. Uh, this is a graph of annual attendance at Washington's National Gallery of Art from 1978 to through 2011, and you'll notice it's about a flat line. The National Gallery had negative 1% net growth over 33 years. And to drive that point home, above that line are people who didn't visit the National Gallery of Art, and below the line are people who did visit the National Gallery of Art. And how you feel about that really depends on what you think the mission of that institution is and how you think about scale. But either way, as the business saying goes, there's a lot of room at the top. And I think about that 10 times improvement. And here's a hypothetical project. Starting at 4.6 million visitors a year in 1978, right along with the National Gallery of Art, and just increasing 10% a year for 33 years. 10% a year is not astronomical performance, uh, so to speak. Uh, a normal for-profit business with investors and a board of directors and uh, certainly a publicly traded organization needs to grow at that rate pretty consistently. So let's, let's graph this out. And you can see that it goes off the y-axis before the end of the chart. So we need to zoom out a little bit. We're going to pull back on the camera. And uh, now every horizontal line represents 100 million people. And you can see the whole shape of this graph for the uh, project, uh, project X. After 33 years of 10% growth, this project has 102 million more visitors a year than the National Gallery of Art. 
let's compare it to unique visits to Wikipedia. And I think we need to zoom out a little bit to see this graph more clearly. So let's zoom out so that every horizontal line represents a billion people. One billion people. And you can see down in the lower right hand corner the Wikipedia unique visits. But oops, I made a mistake. That's not Wikipedia unique visits a year. That's Wikipedia unique visits a month. So I need to normalize that data. Let's scale it up just basically by multiplying the monthly visits by 12, and that's where we get. Compare that with the growth of the internet. Currently, 34% of the world's population has reliable internet access. Compared to 4.6 million National Gallery of Art visitors, that's a, a 2.395 billion person difference today. And when the National Gallery of Art, when we began recording these figures in 1978, and when most of our institutions were, were chartered and formed their notions of themselves, when they minted their dreams, this audience uh, comprising 34% of the human beings on Earth was unimaginable. You couldn't come to work and imagine reaching those people, let alone having them as collaborators or co-creators or part of a community. You just couldn't have that thought. But you can now. The American broadcast industry was overjoyed to have 108 million viewers for the 2013 Super Bowl, our big football extravaganza in January. The last time I checked, Gangnam Style on YouTube had 1.3 billion views. It's probably 1.5 now. And that number keeps growing. It keeps growing. TED recently, in November 2012, served its billionth video. Wikipedia has 1.8 billion edits, and when you go to this page, uh, the tens and single placeholder digits update well, the whole number updates in real time, but those numbers spin so fast they practically blur. Wikipedia is being updated 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Zooniverse is a website where citizens can help with scientific projects. Currently, there are almost 800,000 people taking part in this project. OpenStreetMaps, as the website says, is a free worldwide map created by people like you, you and me, over 900,000 users have made 14 million edits and created 1.6 billion map locations. Cartography, like museum curatorship and librarianship, used to be the providence of experts. But who knows more about your neighborhood than you do? Kickstarter. In 2012, 2.2 million people from 177 countries pledged $319 million to support 18,000 new creative projects. And the scope and breadth of these projects is quite breathtaking. MIT OpenCourseWare, the first 10 years of the project served 100 million users. And in the next 10 years, they want to reach a billion users. And as the call-out bubble says, this order of magnitude of, of effort and ambition is really visible at web scale. This starts to feel like a truly web scale endeavor. But there are other kinds of scale I've come to realize in, in, in talking with uh, museum curators and librarians and archivists. I'm thinking that scale in addition to just being big, big numbers, has a z-axis, like in geometry, an x, y, z coordinate system. Sorry for being a little geeky with that. But the z-axis represents emotional depth and impact on individuals. Um, it scales not in quantities of people served, but in how deeply we affect each of those people. A good example of this is the Shakespeare Behind Bars program in the United States, which enables prison inmates to participate in Shakespeare performances and readings. Um, the program participants report uh, inmates who have been involved in the program say they experience a profound personal growth through it, first by recognizing the depths of their own emotions, then by connecting with fellow prisoners through the camaraderie of sharing a stage. And inmates who participate in this program have dramatically lower recidivism 
rates, um, down to a low of 7% compared to 43% in the general prison population. That's a dramatic impact. Another interesting z-axis example is a program called the Human Library, which I believe was started in Copenhagen in the 70s, but is now being run out of the Toronto Public Library. You go to the library and register yourself as an interesting person, and then other visitors can check you out and get to know you in these conversational settings in the trusted space of a library. Um, the article that I read about this program says, Toronto Public Library held its first human library event at five branches in November, attracting more than 200 users who checked out the likes of a police officer, a comedian, a sex worker turned club owner, a model, and a survivor of cancer, homelessness, and poverty. The other special kind of scale is what I'm calling zero to one, going from a total absence of something to the basic presence of it. You don't need to reach millions and millions or billions of people with this, but the difference between having nothing and having something can be utterly profound. Room to Read is a nonprofit that builds libraries and schools in places where literacy and education are wanted but absent. The, U the United Nations estimates that 850 million people worldwide lack access to basic literacy and two-thirds of those people are women. And 100 million primary age children are not in school. That's truly zero, as most developing nations feel that access to basic literacy is the fundamental cornerstone and building block for all of the economic and personal emotional development they want for their citizens. Since 1998, Room to Read has distributed 10 million books built 12,000 libraries and 3,200 schools around the world. And it's an amazing story of uh, entrepreneurial drive from the founder, John Wood, applied to a very basic human need, also, though, at scale. I highly recommend his book, uh, which is called Leaving Microsoft to Save the World. It's an amazing story. Uh, John Wood wrote in this uh, Nick Kristof article in the New York Times, in 20 years, I'd like to have 100,000 libraries reaching 50 million kids. Our 50-year goal is to reverse the notion that any child can be told, you were born in the wrong place at the wrong time, and so you will not get educated. That idea belongs on the scrap heap of history. I wonder how many of our organizations have credible 20 or 50-year uh, goals. Cultural impoverishment or lack of access to the tools of learning or personal discovery isn't just a third world thing. This does exist everywhere in society. I found this uh, uh, article by Caitlin Moran, Libraries, Cathedrals of Our Souls. She writes, everything I am is based on this ugly building on its lonely lawn, lit up during winter darkness, open in the slashing rain, which allowed a girl so poor she didn't even own a purse to come in twice a day and experience actual magic, traveling through time, making contact with the dead. Dorothy Parker, Stella Gibbons, Charlotte Bronte, Spike Milligan. A library in the middle of a community is a cross between an emergency exit, a life raft, and a festival. No new libraries will be built to replace them, these libraries. These libraries will be lost forever. And in their place, we will have thousands more public spaces where you are simply the money in your pocket rather than the hunger in your heart. Kids, poor kids, will never know the fabulous benign quirk of self-esteem of walking into their library and thinking, I have read 60% of the books in here. I'm awesome. Libraries that stayed open during the Blitz will be closed by budgets. A trillion small doors closing. And that's in your backyard. I do love museums, libraries, and archives. And I do want them not just to be successful, but to be super successful. Because the job we have now in society is so important. We need to put the tools of knowledge creation into more hands. We need to share the joy and meaning of artistic and cultural exploration with more citizens. We need to deepen engagement 
with the challenges that face our species and nurture the habits of a civil and sustainable society. And if we don't do this work, who will? But the question is, can we do it quickly enough and at big enough scale to make a substantial difference in the lives of individuals and, <laughs> and the fate of our species? Now, don't get me wrong. I love museums, libraries, archives, performing arts organizations. I love it all. And I don't want less of the kind of magical interactions that can happen in these uh, institutions. I want more of everything. I want more glams. I want more visitors in them. I want deeper engagement with those visitors. I want more web from the organizations. I want more participation, better outcomes. I want it all. And I think we can have it all. Uh, I think if we begin to apply what some institutions, some organizations have learned about creating value on the web. And if we do it with force, at scale, with bigger dreams, I think it's a win for everybody. So thank you. This, what you've just sat through <laughs> is um, a sketch from a larger presentation that's available up on SlideShare with hyper, hyperlinks and footnotes and the whole thing. So thank you.